Um, thank you all for coming to tonight's event at the uh, Policy and Practice Seminar. Uh, we understand that you have a choice of events to attend, so we're happy that you've chosen to be here with us. Um, it's an honor to welcome Professor Christy Ford from the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. Currently, Professor Ford is a Plumer Research Fellow at St. Anne's College in Oxford University. Um, she's also a member of the Executive Board of the Journal Regulation and Governance and previously was uh, an editor at the journal. She's published widely on the subjects of government regulation and how we can better use it to solve society's ills, um, particularly in the challenging sector of financial regulation, um, which is appropriate given that in a previous life she was also a practicing solicitor, or was, we might say, attorney um, in administrative law and securities regulation. Um, tonight, Professor Ford is speaking about her book, Innovation in the State, Finance Regulation and Justice. Um, any of us who have studied the topic of regulation right, have encountered at one point or another the phenomenon of regulators, um, discussing how to discuss this in class today, coping or not coping with, adapting to or dealing with, or whatever you might say, with private sector innovation. Right? Um, and the subject received surprisingly little scholarly uh, attention for a long time, as important as it was and still is, um, until Professor Ford first wrote her article in, on innovation framing regulation in 2013, um, which was followed by the book last year, Innovation in the State. So the book's a comprehensive treatise on these subjects and particularly how interdisciplinary scholarship on regulation has treated the issue of flexibility and innovation in regulation over the past several decades. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Ford. Thank you. Um, so let me start by just thanking uh, you all, uh, in particular Dr. Provost, uh, for uh, bringing me here. It's an honor to be here uh, uh, for a number of reasons, including the fact that it's an honor to speak to a, 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 a political science and laws audience as opposed to just the laws audience that I generally tend to speak to. Um, but I also, I guess, um, want to congratulate you all on being at such a remarkable institution. Uh, I'm sure you know what a terrific place UCL is, and I'm just on, thrilled to be here. Um, so thank you. Now give me two seconds and I'm going to see if I can plug <laughs> myself in here. All right. Um, so uh, as, would you be Dr. Provost or Professor Provost? Doctor. Doctor. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> as Dr. Provost uh, has suggested, uh, there's the book. Um, and its real concerns are, as he suggested, the relationship between innovation and regulation and the implications of that relationship for a broader set of social priorities. Now, I don't need to tell this audience about the challenges associated with chaos and uncertainty at the political level. I know we have a Donald Trump and trade talk going on next door, and the other, I think, competitor to this is just watching what's happening on an ongoing basis today here with regard to the uh, current government. Um, uh, so there is that level of politics which obviously is relevant and pressing and sometimes urgent and riveting. Uh, but then uh, I guess in an audience like this I also don't really need to tell you how important regulation is as, uh, as an engagement with those events and as the place where a lot of politics actually ultimately is embedded and made real. Um, and so I have been thinking about innovation in the state because innovation is one of those things that changes the ground rules. People win and lose as a function of innovation. Uh, regulatory choices around innovation have distributional consequences whether we choose to acknowledge them or not. And for that reason I have been trying to understand better how regulation engages with innovation and how it might do so better. So for those who are curious, the cover in, image is actually, it's, all, it's actually one picture. It's of a sculpture in a French river. The artist's name is Laurent Gongora. And um, maybe this was a little bit too meta, but my thinking was that the words finance, regulation, and justice really sort of mapped onto the three frames, which together are one picture. Um, finance being the sort of the, the force, I don't want to call it a natural force, I think that's stretching it too far, but, f but the force that one is trying to challenge here, which really operates pursuant to its own properties and according to its own principles. Um, regulation is the sculpture itself, which is a series of sort of blades that have been embedded right into the rock face, then the water goes down over them. It's quite remarkable. And 
Uh, and then the rock, I would like to think of as actually representing justice and our fundamental social commitments as, as, as a society and as a polity. Um, and, and, and my point is really that regulation operates at that interface. So um, now if we were going to try to define innovation, I can start with the Oxford English Dictionary, which defines it as the act or process of making changes in something established, especially by introducing new methods, ideas, or products. So this is to be distinguished from invention, which is the creating of the new idea. Innovation is the point where applying that idea in practice, you make it real. Um, innovation can be technological, it can be business oriented, it can be you know, f fancy and high tech or not. Um, but I want to emphasize that the idea of innovation is not actually limited by the OED or otherwise to good innovation, to socially beneficial innovation. And yet what we see around the language that we use with respect to innovation is this kind of thing, right? These sort of aspirational, romantic images around innovation. So I start the book with a linguistic analysis of how we use the word innovation. And it turns out that our dominant, this is probably not a surprise, our dominant conversation around innovation really still does imagine uh, innovation as this almost magical phenomenon that will uh, grow the pie and solve our problems. It's the product of this cherished good of human creativity. Um, and our language, uh, both in popular and academic co uh, conversation, still really operates as if um, innovation is this unalloyed good, this extraordinarily positive thing, and which you know, brings uh, so much possibility with it. And now these days, and here's, here's another image, right? Um, so these days, there's so much of this. Um, and these days, uh, we're also more aware of the counter-narrative, obviously, which worries about innovation as being the, product, the, the thing that produces environmental disaster and social dislocation and instability and all kinds of human tragedy. Uh, related to that, I think, are worries about capitalism, which is really the most innovative or form of, organ of uh, economic organization. So I, my point is not that that counter-narrative doesn't exist. Certainly the romantic account of innovation is the dominant one. But I would also argue that the counter-narrative is not actually more nuanced than the romantic account of innovation. We sort of toggle between these two extremes without necessarily investigating sufficiently what we mean by innovation itself. Um, and so this book is not anti-innovation. It's just anti-romance about innovation. Um, and I'd like to imagine that we can do better in thinking about this phenomenon, which is so fundamental and significant in, uh, in our worlds. So that's the idea of innovation. The second definition I have here is the definition of regulation, which is, of course, much less um, common in the lexicon as a word. It's certainly not the subject of the kind of rhapsodic you know, uh, prayers that we see around innovation. Uh, uh, but drawing on some of the scholars in the area, Julia Black, Philip Selznick, and to some extent Christopher Hood, this is my definition of regulation. Sustain an intentional activity, and I do mean by the state. There are lots of things that can regulate out there in the world, but I mean regulation by the state, and I'm happy to talk further about that, that limit, although I am including both indirect and direct methods to control, order, or influence the behavior of others. Now, the book starts with four stories from my area, financial regulation. Um, these are four discrete aspects of financial regulation. They're not even from the same country. Um, but my point here is really to illustrate the ways in which innovation seeps around regulation no matter what its form. So for those of you who are in Dr. Provost's class, you will have read an earlier version of these case studies. I think I didn't include one of them. Uh, um, but, but the point here is really um, to understand how no matter how you structure regulation, you're going to run into problems in the face of innovation. The innovation in question here is securitization and the creation of a derivatives market which allows the sale of securitized products. Um, for those who are not financial regulation people, if you can just imagine really fun functionally shattering the atom of property which used to be sort of an integral unit within financial regulation, corporate law, and now as a function of financial innovation is not. So this innovation uh, undermined all of these different regulatory strategies. So the first is rules-based regulation. My example is in the Enron era, US generally accepted accounting principles, market-based regu market regulation uh, in Canada, uh, the Basel II capital adequacy regime, and notice and comment rulemaking in the United States. In each case, regulation failed to perform as intended 
partly because it didn't take seriously enough the swamping effect that private sector regulation or innovation rather would have on the re these regulatory structures which were designed to challenge, channel, channel it. Um, so innovation circumvents regulation no matter what form regulation takes. Now my point is not that it's pointless. My point is not that all of these regulatory strategies are equivalent because they're not. Some work better than others and some work better than others in different places. Um, and certainly we can learn from this experience and improve our strategies going forward. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, but the point remains. Now I talk about financial regulation and, uh, and this is an area where in particular there's been an awful lot of research lately that talks about the particular ways in which, uh, you're not meant to be reading any of this, this is il illustrative, um, <laughs> and no need to squint, um, which really points to the ways in which changing the nature of financial products can really fundamentally undermine the regulatory process that is meant to surround them. So for example, derivatives have shattered this atom of property in ways that have direct consequences for corporate law and for voting in a corporate uh, structure. Innovation can produce shape-shifting so that something that you used to be able to regulate as an institution suddenly is no longer really operating in that space and it operates at the level of contract, which is within the realm of private law. There are assets that are safe, are considered safe um, in, in, uh, in, certain, in particular spaces, but that stop being safe when they are being applied in a separate sort of market space uh, and substituting for some other asset. Um, regulators in the face of all of this can be left focusing on the wrong things. Actors uh, can come out of nowhere uh, seemingly to the regulator and suddenly occupy massive space um, in, the, in, in the capital markets. Uh, regulators can have jurisdictional turf fights and suffer from recognition problems and trying to understand whether a new uh, product is, you know, falls into category A or category B. Um, and, uh, and so these are really, I'd like to suggest, everybody I'm sure has seen this cover, I'd like to suggest these are really sort of fundamentally epistemological questions. It's about the fact that we do not know what we don't know, and we don't know how we know what we do know. Right? These are really fundamental questions about the phenomenon that we're actually dealing with here. Um, so, I have a dozen more examples in the book, <laughs> and I'm not going to uh, uh, belabor uh, the point. Um, but to summarize the sort of my, my, my first sort of larger claim, I guess my overall larger claim, it would be, first of all, that regulators in financial regulation, but not only in financial regulation, made a series of errors in the run-up to the financial crisis, and that we are not actually doing better now. We haven't learned as much as we ought to have from that experience. So the kinds of errors they made were first to assume that innovation was monolithic, was this sort of romantic phenomenon that was, um, that, and, that, and that it would operate the same in all different spaces. The second assumption, which I claim was flawed, was just about how regulation operates. If you build your regulatory structures on a series of assumptions, and those assumptions prove to be, you know, as you must, and those assumptions prove to be mistaken, then your regulatory structure is not going to work. Um, additionally, I would say that uh, the scholarship in the area, but really especially the practice in the area within financial regulators, um, focused too much on technique, not enough on politics, and failed to recognize the fact that regulation really is fundamentally a, a political project. Um, so the first point is really that innovation is not monolithic. The book talks about this in, at some length, um, and the point is really that innovation is complex, variable, uh, dynamic, definitely not all beneficial by def definition, also not terribly predictable. So it's not the case that you can use the efficient market hypothesis and model in, you know, innovative trajectories and, and assume that the best ideas are going to rise to the top. That's not actually how innovation works. Innovation is the product of what Claude Lévi-Strauss called Bricolage, and it's the uh, and it's it's the product of contingency and very context specific problem solving. Um, different innovations. Oh, sorry, I meant to flip these slides. Different innovations proceed at different uh, 
uh, uh, speeds as well. So the familiar story we hear about is between radical and incremental innovations. I'm not sure I love that distinction, and I don't love that distinction, but it's useful in some ways. And certainly, different kinds of uh, innovations proceeding at different speeds raise different kinds of problems. Uh, diffusion complicates the regulatory task, and fundamentally, innovation is a very human process which is characterized by things like network relationships and uh, interconnections and you know, weak links and so on. Um, and none of this was, the pro was part of the conversation before the financial crisis about how innovation was developing, and none of it is the subject of conversation now. My second general claim would be that uh, flawed regulatory assumptions can be dangerous and can produce flawed outcomes. And so I identify three, again, in this first chapter that some of you may have read. And the first is this idea um, that complexity uh, is almost a showstopper in terms of understanding regulation. So in the run-up to the financial crisis, um, it was, I think, relatively common for the financial industry to make a pitch to regulators to the effect that uh, the financial markets are so fast-moving and so complex that no regulator operating on limited resources at a distance could possibly understand what was going on. And so therefore, it was important that they at least collaborate, if not completely delegate, regulation to the financial institutions themselves. Um, now, I'm not denying that ca global capital markets are fast moving and complex. Absolutely, they are. Um, but I want to distinguish between the reality and the narrative, the self-serving narrative that was advanced in, um, uh, by some financial institutions. And complexity is absolutely a problem for regulation. I would not say otherwise. But by framing the entire agenda around this inevitability of speed and complexity in global financial markets, regulators really lost the ability to ar articulate an independent set of regulatory priorities um, that, was, that stood apart from some panicked attempt to try and keep up with innovation in the field. And this mindset also affected their operative definitions of expertise. It left social questions about the nature uh, and implications of all the speed and complexity unanswered, maybe even completely unasked. Um, and it insulated the broader uh, regular, or it insulated the, this account from a sort of broader regulatory reorientation around uh, social priorities. Um, and I would say this is happening again today around fintech, financial technology. A second assumption uh, uh, which characterized regulatory thinking is really this idea that the regulatory moment is the only important moment or the most important moment. And if you just focus on getting the regulatory text right, you'll be OK. So without paying attention to sort of the, um, the setup and the follow through, and to use the, the tennis analogy here. Um, and in fact, the spaces before and behind the actual regulatory moment are very important when what you're talking about is financial, uh, structured financial products, because you're building things in advance for the purpose of getting through a particular regulatory window. And if you don't understand exactly what those products are in the before moment, you're not going to be able to regulate them properly. Um, there's a sort of an equivalent concern at the post rulemaking stage when you have to ask yourself who is still in the room during the po at the point at which the really difficult detailed decisions are made uh, because that tends to be uh, a very powerful space for tweaking a particular sort of legislative agenda. My third observation about flawed assumptions uh, in, in, in regulation is really this idea that you can talk about innovation as if it operates at some metaphysical level of isolation from innovation itself, which it doesn't. Innovation and regulation operate in a reflexive relationship. They are each affected by the other. Um, so for example, if you build a regulatory structure that is meant, that is designed to, to uh, embrace innovation, what you will get, among other things, is more innovation, which puts strain on exactly those mechanisms you were building to try and deal with the innovation. And I would say innovation is not only in a reflexive relationship with regulation, but it's also a variable one. So for example, there are some innovations that are designed explicitly to get around regulation. That's the point. That's the innovation, right? There are some occasions when private sector innovation can actually work in tandem with regulation and can improve it. 
So if one thinks about uh, regulation around best available technology standards, right, or rolling best practices, rulemaking standards, those are, uh, those are uh, situations where innovation at the private level is supposed to help regulation. Sometimes innovation proceeds on a parallel track to regulation or outside the familiar regulatory jurisdiction of a particular regulator, um, but it can still heavily affect or even undermine the regulatory structure in that space. Um, I, I mean, I suppose one example would be Uber outside the regulated taxi industry. There are lots of examples in the financial space. And just as importantly, we're always trying to do it on the cheap, uh, which is uh, always a mistake, it seems to me. Um, my third point is that regulation is inevitably a political project. So uh, let me just say, I, I spend three chapters trying to define what the modern, what the modern approach to regulation is um, and what the sort of basket of flexible regulatory techniques is. There's this idea of the regulatory state, which differs, of course, from the US to the UK to the EU um, and, uh, and, and has a number of different priors. Uh, uh, but I, I guess for today, I only want to signal that this is that, that I'm not um, using the word regulation uh, in an unnuanced way to refer to talk about sort of a, a American style capture theory or uh, to sort of uh, revive the old 1970s trope about command and control and how inflexible it is and so on. I really would say that this is this is important literature. It's recent literature and it's nuanced and sophisticated literature. Um, and at the same time, in regard to innovation in particular, it has made some errors in terms of its, um, uh, I guess I could say it could be improved uh, in terms of how it engages with it. So for example, when I started looking at how this literature engaged with innovation, one of the things I found was that overwhelmingly, uh, there were no specific innovations being discussed. So that same romantic account of innovation as being this thing you want to foster characterized this literature without an awful lot of attention to exactly what that innovation looks like, how it's being generated, by which parties, for what purposes, who benefits, and so on. Secondly, it, was, it has been my impression that there has been a certain amount of blindness to the political and normative overtones of uh, uh, of, um, of this scholarship and of how it especially ha how it has been used in practice. So for example, there's a lot of work in the regulation space that really talks about technique, how you can build a better rules-based system or how the relationship between enforcement and compliance or whatever, which really operates at this level, this register of technique. Um, there are important principled reasons why that was the case. So if you are, a, you know, a civic Republican, a neo-Republican, if you're a deliberative Democrat, if you, if you believe that regulators should not be the ones making deep political decisions, then it makes sense for regulatory theory to just talk about technique. But I think the failure is in failing to understand that those regulatory decisions have those political overtones. You can't pretend they don't. Um, secondly, uh, there were times uh, when agreement at, on two ends of the ideological spectrum were was, was seen as a sign of a good uh, idea, right? If you can get people on the right and the left to agree on something, then that must indicate a level of really basic consensus around something important. And I would suggest that that's not actually always what it represented, and that um, there was probably less consensus about important things than uh, it appeared, uh, and that people who cared about regulation and adopted some of these flexible techniques were not in fact advocating for the same thing as their false friends who were advocating for a more deregulatory stance. And that was all sort of ignored uh, uh, during, during a certain time period. And then I would say there was a, there, sorry, it's not, it's not co-potation, it's co-optation, political co-optation um, uh, by scholarship, or sorry, of scholarship by regulators. So uh, for regulators, it's extraordinarily convenient to be able to say new regulatory technique means that I can achieve better outcomes more efficiently at less cost with less regulatory burden and basically I can uh, uh, advance the project along all matrices at once with no hard choices at all having to be made. And those were the kinds of claims that were being made about regulatory technique and financial regulation in the run-up to the crisis. And that's actually not the case. There are always hard choices to be made. And uh, I think there was a failure to call people out uh, for that, 
in real time. And of course, the resourcing and political will problem is a, um, is a, is a problem perennially. But I would say that adopting these flexible regulatory techniques can be very promising. But one should not anticipate that they're going to take fewer resources than a more rigid rules-based system. On the contrary, I think they take more resources to do better. Uh, all right, so here are the uh, lessons learned thus far. And I would say we are not doing better in the post-financial uh, crisis era. Um, and further, that innovation is still the most profound and most unappreciated challenge to regulation that regulators face today. And it's not because innovation is bad. It's because we have still not learned how to see it clearly. It's not monolithic. The efficient market hypothesis will not help you understand it. It's socially constructed with all the attendant dynamics of human irrationality and uh, group behavior. It's environmentally and contextually contingent. Different innovations will look, or the same innovation in two different spaces will look quite different. Um, different innovations move at different paces and raise particular problems for regulation. Uh, and all of this, I would say, is relevant again when we're talking about uh, fintech sandboxes and cryptocurrency uh, and the new regulatory stress that we once again see around keeping up. So here we are again. These are the kinds of messages that are portrayed. Right? The innovation is a race. You have to keep up with the pace of change. And, uh, and the result is this sort of cognitive fra framing around a sense of panic that that is really the fundamental regulatory priority. Um, I can speak further uh, about where I think we are now, but maybe in the interest of time, I will uh, get to my two sort of overarching final points. And the first is, I think we can do better just thinking about this problem. I see three fundamental questions. So at the end of the book, uh, following these examples, I uh, argue that um, the three really fundamental questions are, uh, Try, is learning to see innovation properly. So understanding what we know, what we don't know, how we know what we think we know. And then secondly, identifying where there are blinders and boundaries. Because any regulatory structure is going to have boundaries. Any regulatory structure is going to have blinders. That's the inevitable result of building a regulatory structure that focuses on something. You can't focus on everything. But understanding what those blinders and boundaries are is essential, I would say, to being able to see uh, challenges coming in uh, orthogonally, you, may, you might say. And then finally, what kinds of tools do we have in place that will allow the regulator to actually track innovation in real time and respond in real time? So using the FinTech sandbox example again, I think sandboxes could be very promising. But as a regulator, you would hope that everyone who's in your sandbox is under an obligation to provide you with buckets of information in comparable formats so that you can learn. Right? So you would think that that would be a point. And that's the kind of resourcing that's not actually happening around a lot of resources. So those would be the, around a lot of sandboxes. And those would be the kinds of tools that you would want if you actually were trying to understand what was going on. Um, and uh, so I have. Uh, this diagram and a table at the end of the book, uh, which is really, I think of it as a sort of a cheat sheet, a critical thinking guide for regulators, uh, which tries to absorb some of the questions uh, uh, that come out of the examples to try and think at a technical level about, um, about, uh, about uh, innovation and how to, uh, how to manage it better. But I would also say, back to my sculpture, uh, that it's also important for regulation to relocate its normative voice. As I've said, regulation has distributive consequences, which can be intentional or unintentional. Innovation has distributive consequences, which can be intentional or un unintentional. And pretending that you're not making distributive choices amounts to endorsing them. I'd suggest that that's not actually defensible. Um, I. Uh, would argue that focusing on technique without reference to the sort of mi micro and macro forces that alter outcomes is a mistake and risks losing, again, uh, risks having regulators lose their normative footing and their, uh, their, their confidence about what it is that they're there to provide as the only voice of the public in the room. Uh, financial regulation in particular is a crucial site for addressing domination in some of its most embedded and pernicious forms. Uh, 
Uh, certainly when I was a student, I would never in a million years have thought that I wanted to study financial regulation, but it's really interesting. <laughs> Um, and looking beyond just formal politics and beyond financial regulation, regulation generally is at the leading edge of policy and politics in ways that we don't always understand and we don't grasp in real time. And some of these very mundane regulatory choices can have profound practical ramifications for some of our most cherished social commitments. So we need a regulatory structure that can see innovation better, that can be attuned to it, that can respond to it at a technical level, but we also need a regulatory structure that can remain attuned to those bedrock commitments around equality and justice and voice and fairness. Uh, and uh, that really calls for an independent-minded uh, regulator. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>